Okay, so then this is the start of the session and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carlo and Jolie who will make the talk in two parts, the syntactic part and uh, another one on uh, normalization or computability, reducibility proof, if I understood correctly. Uh, just uh, I just to recall the um, uh, recommendation of the organizer, uh, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand, but uh, it's only for very important questions like uh, misunderstanding uh, because of problem in slides or things like that. Did I do it correctly, Chris and Benedict? Yes. So then, uh, Carlo, it's your turn. You have uh, okay. between, uh, 45 and 15 minutes. All right. Uh, thank you. All right. So welcome to uh, part one of the session on, on Carlo. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, first of all, I want to say that, um, this talk will not contain a definition of the phrase type theory, uh, as I know that's a, a controversial topic, but I think we can probably agree that one of the things that, uh, makes type theory, you know, interesting to our whole community is, is the way that it, uh, makes certain kinds of math work very well on computers, right? And, I think this is some kind of, you know, sorcery that, that we don't fully understand maybe. Uh, but when uh, one of us, uh, or at least uh, I think a lot of us have had the experience that when we uh, come to type theory, you know, the, the first time we, we learn about it, we think, oh boy, yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't do the voice, but we say, oh boy, you know, here's uh, this uh, really cool idea. I can use type theory uh, to solve my math problems, I can invent a new type theory to, uh, to you know, solve this specific kind of problem that I have. But as soon as we start trying to do that, uh, we realize we've really made a huge mistake uh, because uh, you know, we, uh, we uh, ask, how do we go about implementing you know, this type theory or what rules should it have? And uh, we start uh, running into all these you know, strange Greek letters, people asking on mailing lists about what z uh, zeta reductions we have. You know, uh, you, you look up uh, what sort of things uh, you need to know about your type theory in order to implement it. And uh, all these mysterious phrases are coming up. You know, these meta theorems, who even knows what any of these mean. And you, you also might've heard that uh, recently there have been some developments where uh, the proofs of some of these meta theorems have been uh, reworked using some ideas uh, called gluing. So today I kind of am giving a, a double header overview talk where I, I wanted to start by uh, saying a bit about the, uh, these mysterious meta theorems and what they have to do with the implementation of type theory and proof assistance. And then in the second half, I wanted to uh, talk about how uh, we can establish uh, these meta theorems using uh, new techniques based on gluing. And uh, I'll focus on uh, some joint work with uh, John Sterling and Daniel Grazer on, uh, for that. Okay, so let's start with uh, meta theory. Uh, again, this is not a definition of type theory, but let's, uh, let's just say for the sake of argument that a type theory is some kind of fancy grammar or algebra or something like that that defines a bunch of uh, collections of things mutually, you know, uh, context types, terms, uh, and then uh, some relations on these uh, types and terms, maybe some other things too, it doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, a proof assistant then is some sort of software that's checking whether the things you say are grammatical, right? So uh, it, uh, the idea is you want to type in some sort of argument and then the proof assistant checks whether uh, what you say can be made to make sense while minimizing the number of uh, stupid questions that it asks you, right? And this sort of uh, push and pull between, uh, you know, the grammar and the stupid questions uh, really, um, you know, drives a lot of the work in type theory. So to give you an example of what I mean, well, for any sort of type theory at all, you could always implement a proof assistant that said you just have to enter entire derivation trees. Uh, this would let you capture basically any type theory you want, but it would be very, very annoying to use. Right, so the role of, um, you know, type checking is, is that by uh, limiting uh, what kinds of things we can have in the theory, 
we can uh, get rid of a lot of the annoying questions that would normally be asked to the user. Uh, and then when we uh, add some uh, principles to uh, intentional type theory, we can uh, both uh, fix some of the things that made it a little annoying to use um, uh, from a practical standpoint, while also um, expanding the range of things that it can talk about, right? Uh, and then I'd say uh, cubicle type theory, the goal is uh, to try to make a hot less annoying to use by adding some more strict equations adding some more principles that the type checker can figure out uh, without needing to ask any questions uh, to the human. So this is just one example of this sort of um, flow of progress in, in type theory. There, there are many, many others. I'm not saying this is the only path that works, but um, you know, this is the sort of idea that drives a lot of the work, at least on the CS side of, of type theory, I would say. So how does uh, type checking work? Well. In some sense, you, you just uh, you know, traverse uh, a term and as you go, you try to build a typing derivation for it. Um, but th there are a bunch of problems with that idea. Uh, one is that uh, it's not clear whether you're supposed to sort of build the derivation outside in or inside out. So uh, on the one hand, if you look at a rule like functional elimination, you see that the uh, the conclusion of the rule doesn't determine all the premises. So if you know that you're trying to check f of a has type d, that doesn't actually tell you what the domain of f is, which you need to type check both f and a. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look at a rule like you know, introduction for coproducts, uh, knowing that a is type a doesn't actually tell you what type uh, in left of a is supposed to have. So you can't just go inside out or outside in. And by the way, yes, you could fully annotate terms um, and, uh, and then the conclusion will always determine the premises, but that's uh, just really annoying. That's uh, way off the scales of, of too annoying uh, on my graph. Um, so uh, one of the ideas uh, that, that we use is uh, called bidirectional type checking. And here we decompose the typing judgment into two modes, basically one, where uh, we have a term and a type, and we are checking that the term has that type. That's probably what you thought type checking was. But there's another mode where we just have a term and it tells us uh, what its type is, and that's called synthesis. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, what do we do for functional elimination? Well, we say that uh, an application will tell us what its type is. And the way that will work is that, uh, well, first we have to make sure that the function tells us what its type is. And uh, now that we know what the type of the function is, we can just check that the argument has the type of the domain. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, we have to type check a, uh, uh, an inleft. So we have to have a type A plus B that we think that uh, the inleft um, is in the type of, and, uh, and then to, we can reduce that uh, type checking problem to just checking that A has type A, okay? Um, now, what do we do about the conversion rule? This is uh, you know, the only reason why we have a judgmental equality in the system. And it's also uh, very weird because it says that uh, for A to have type A, well, we can show it has any other type that is equal to A but uh, clearly that, um, that type is not coming from anywhere on the bottom of the rule. And one of the great insights is that it actually suffices to sort of do conversion only at the boundary between checking and synthesis. So here, if, uh, if we're trying to check that A has type A, but A tells us it has type B, then we have two types A and B in our hand and we just have to check that uh, A has type B, or sorry, that, that types A and B are equal. Um, and uh, so an example of where this boundary occurs is, well, suppose that we uh, are trying to um, synthesize the type of an application of a function to some variable, right? And the function tells us its type is A or B, but the variable has type A prime. And now because we have a context, uh, the a variable always tells us what its type is. Uh, so here we have this boundary between uh, checking and synthesis where uh, this will synthesize the right type so long as we can uh, make sure that uh, types A and A prime are equal. And for that, we need some sort of algorithm that, uh, that you know, says yes or no to that, uh, that kind of question. Now, 
it's pretty easy to see that this uh, strategy is sound because uh, the algorithm is basically just a restriction of all of the possible typing derivations. So if the algorithm uh, uh, succeeds, then you know, we, we basically have constructed a typing derivation. Uh, it's very unclear whether uh, this strategy is complete though. Uh, so to give you an example of uh, something that might fail, imagine that um, uh, we had a judgmental equality between type zero arrow one and zero arrow two, right? Then uh, depending on uh, what, which one of these two types a uh, function synthesizes, we can synthesize that the application is either of type one or of type two. And uh, that's not good because uh, maybe we needed to have one of these types but not the other. So uh, we would need to do some sort of backtracking maybe to, uh, to figure out uh, which one of these it was supposed to be. It, it kind of throws a wrench into the works. Um, so the completeness relies on the uh, judgmental injectivity of uh, the type constructors like the arrow. So for example, uh, this says that the only way the two uh, arrow types can be judgmentally equal is if their domains and their codomains are judgmentally equal. And uh, this is a very difficult theorem to prove. Um, you might intuitively think, uh, well, how else could it be the case? Uh, well, first of all, obviously in, in uh, models, this is usually not true. You can uh, you know, sometimes arrange that the collection of uh, elements of these two sets, for example, are exactly the same. Uh, and it could be the case that uh, they're also judgmentally equal through some mysterious, I don't know, maybe you beta expand this and then something, something univalence, I don't know, some magic happens in the middle and uh, these two things are judgmentally equal. All right, now, how could that possibly happen? I'm surely that's, uh, that's impossible. Well, actually it is very possible. Um, an example of a way that this can fail is if you have the uh, equality reflection rule in your system. This says that you, uh, you have some uh, equality connective that uh, internalizes exactly the uh, judgmental equality. Now, if you have reflection, then uh, what that means is that if you're in a context where you have assumed that uh, zero arrow one equals zero arrow two, then of course these two are judgmentally equal. Uh, but on the other hand, in that context, uh, the types one and two are not equal. I mean, this is a consistent uh, um, uh, thing to have in your context. And uh, people often talk about how equality reflection is uh, bad because it makes uh, the, the equality judgment undecidable. Um, I think this is actually a much more fundamental problem with trying to implement it uh, because when you don't have injectivity, uh, that means that you can't actually uh, decompose typing problems. You can't just reduce, um, you know, checking a, uh, a, a function application to checking its components, right? And that's really the core idea behind type checking. You want to sort of modularly decompose um, the goal as you go. Uh, and by the way, uh, rewrite rules can cause similar sorts of problems. E again, even if they're consistent. I mean, both rewrite rules and equality reflection are perfectly consistent, um, but uh, they can disrupt the sort of delicate balance of the, of the syntax. So how do we um, prove uh, the injectivity? Well, to do so, we basically have to completely characterize the uh, equality of the whole theory. And so I would, uh, one way to phrase this is that it's, uh, it requires us to solve the word problem for terms and types and, and contexts. And what I mean by that is just in some way we need to take, you know, the collections of uh, terms uh, modulo judgmental equality and find some way of presenting them uh, as a set that has completely discrete equality, some sort of codes for normal forms or, you know, fully reduced terms, something like that. Uh, uh, that uh, corresponds exactly to the equivalence classes. And uh, this is a very hard theorem to prove, but uh, it has basically everything I ever want to know as a corollary. Uh, for example, uh, judgmental injectivity uh, follows. This also gives you an algorithm for checking type equality, which we needed in the conversion rule. That's just by uh, comparing normal forms for equality. It also even gives you consistency because you just have to make sure that the uh, the normal forms in the uh, closed context of, of the empty type uh, don't exist. And there are two main strategies for showing normalization. 
one is based on sort of untyped techniques. Uh, so if you kind of remember that the uh, equivalence classes of terms are made up of, let me say, raw typed terms considered modulo only alpha, not beta or eta, then you can sort of carve out a subset of those that are the so-called normal forms. And you can, uh, for any equivalence class over here, you can uh, pick some representative, beta normalize it, and you get some sort of normal form over here. Now, you have to check a few things. First of all, you have to check that this map is well-defined. So you have to check that any two uh, elements of the same equivalence class get sent to the same normal form. Uh, and then you also have to check that uh, this map uh, actually terminates uh, because in general, in the untyped lambda calculus, you can't just uh, beta normalize every term. Right? And this is uh, where the you know, infamous uh, strong normalization theorem comes in. This uh, gives us termination. It says that every sequence of beta reductions from a well-typed term uh, will terminate. Uh, I just want to say as an aside, uh, there's a slightly different strategy based on pure type systems where you can actually define the judgmental equality of the system to be untyped beta convertibility. Uh, and this solves some of those problems because, well, you don't have to check well-definedness. But uh, I don't think this is a good idea. And the reason is that now uh, the very definition of the theory itself uh, relies on concepts from the untyped lambda calculus. So if you want to show that you have a model in say sets, you know, uh, that have nothing to do with uh, lambda calculus, you actually have to prove a bunch of uh, complicated meta theorems just to um, show that you can sort of extricate the definition from the lambda calculus. Uh, another issue with uh, uh, either of these untyped methods is that it's very difficult to account for type sensitive equations. And it is possible, uh, and uh, in Koch, there has been a lot of work um, you know, extending the equality to handle a bunch of uh, very fancy things. Uh, but uh, maybe you can see why it would be difficult uh, because uh, you know, you, uh, for uh, Ada laws, for example, you can't, it's hard to just say that some term always turns into the unique inhabitant of the um, of the unit type, and similarly, you know, I'm very interested in uh, things like cubicle type theory, where uh, you have these sort of equations that say, you know, if you take the left endpoint of of any path expression, then you get exactly uh, what the type tells you the left endpoint is. So these are things that are hard to do in an untyped way, but they're uh, but you can account for them uh, very naturally using one of a family of techniques called normalization by evaluation. And uh, these techniques uh, scale very well uh, to all sorts of uh, not only eta laws, but you know, cubicle type theory and, and other things where uh, the basic idea, and unfortunately I don't have time to go into it, uh, but the basic idea is that you uh, use beta reduction only sort of at the top level to find out what the head constructor of something is. And then you go through these sort of type directed expansion phases to account for both the eta laws and the congruence laws. Now, I didn't say anything yet about canonicity. Uh, canonicity is uh, the theorem that says that the closed normal forms of the natural number type are, are numerals, you know, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and you know the rest. Um, and canonicity is basically uh, the theorem that says we have enough beta laws to account for all of the features that we put into the syntax. Um, this is a very popular warm up exercise for normalization. Well, Obviously, it's a corollary of normalization if, um, if it is actually true, if canonicity is true. Uh, but also, the proof is uh, basically always strictly easier than the normalization proof. Uh, one reason why we uh, care about it is that it implies that we can run uh, proofs as programs, which is you know, something we're interested in as uh, computer scientists. And uh, how does that work? Well. Uh, if the canonicity theorem holds, then uh, the, you have a procedure for uh, computing the value of any um, closed uh, construction of a natural number. It's just uh, you, you run the canonicity proof and see what the normal form is. But I want to point out that the converse is actually false, that you can have a proofs as programs interpretation without having canonicity. And uh, maybe a good example of this is that, well, a book hot doesn't have canonicity, but it does have operational models now because you can uh, 
you can embed it in a cubicle type theory and then uh, run the term there. Uh, so it is, uh, so you don't actually need CanNISTY to uh, run things as programs. Okay, now the way that we prove uh, normalization or canonicity is to um, uh, associate to every raw judgment uh, a sort of proof of relevant property. And these properties are known as computability predicates or logical relations, or I think a lot of other names as well. Uh, so uh, the way this works, for example, is that uh, for every context and uh, type in that context, you have some sort of predicate over um, the raw terms, the raw well type terms uh, of that type in that context. Uh, and for example, the predicate for closed uh, elements of the natural number type is uh, this term reduces to some numeral. It doesn't say which numeral because you can use uh, you know, beta reduction to figure out which one. Uh, and then you sort of mutually prove that all of the predicates you've assigned to all the judgments, these all hold for every derivable judgment. Uh, this technique is uh, very flexible. It, it can be uh, scaled to not only all sorts of type theories, but uh, also all sorts of programming languages, including ones that have very bizarre features that are hard to explain using uh, sort of standard math. Uh, but especially in the context of uh, dependent type theory, there are a few um, sort of recurring issues with it, right? Uh, one is that uh, there's a lot of repetition both within a proof and across proofs. For example, you have to explain what it means to be computable as a context and as a substitution and as a type and as a term. And all these concepts are very similar, but not exactly the same. Um, it also uh, relies on the fact that uh, you can kind of find raw terms living inside the equivalence classes uh, of terms. So it's tied to a specific presentation of uh, the theory itself. And uh, a very technical but serious uh, issue is that it's uh, difficult to make universes work. So the, the problem here is basically that uh, to be a computable element of a universe, uh, you basically want that to be the same as being a computable small type. So you want um, to be able to have a predicate, some computability predicate associated to every element of the universe. But uh, an assignment of predicates to elements of the universe is not itself proof or relevant. That's not a, a property, it's, a, it's actually a structure. So uh, we have to jump through some hoops where we normally uh, basically define a lookup table for predicates on the side, and then the computability predicate for the universe says, uh, basically that if you look up uh, in this um, uh, in this lookup table then then uh, the element will have uh, some associated predicate there okay so uh, if you suffer from syntax brain it's time to alt tab back to uh, the the talk because now I'm going to transition to uh, talking about uh, gluing and uh, some new ways of uh, proving this uh, kind of theory So let me uh, make an analogy. So if you think of a normalization theorem as a, uh, you know, giving an inductive characterization of the, uh, of the equality of some sort of uh, theory presented by generators and relations, then you can kind of think of the logical relations proof as some sort of fancy encode decode method. Uh, this is the only crowd to which I think explaining logical relations as encode decode is uh, potentially useful, but anyway. Uh, so then you can think of an assignment of computability predicates as an instance of a sort of prop valued induction principle uh, for the uh, presentation by generators and relations. So then it's natural to ask, what if we had a type valued induction principle? What if we could actually assign not a, just a predicate, but a structure or a family of, uh, of uh, computability proofs uh, to everything in the theory? This automatically solves the universe problem uh, because now the, uh, the computability family for the universe can actually uh, consist of computability families. Uh, but the major question here is what is the correct type valued induction principle? I mean, it's hard enough to find the prop valued induction principle for, uh, for type theory because type theory is a very complicated thing to define. Now, one uh, strategy for doing this is to use a uh, quotient inductive inductive types, basically to uh, 
make sure that you have a dependent type theory that can admit dependent type theories as one form of inductive definition, and then you, know, you can just uh, use the induction principle within the type theory. Uh, the other sort of thing you can do is uh, you can use category theory and use an induction principle uh, that, you, that you obtain from there. And this is uh, what uh, people like to call initiality. Um, you know, another scary topic to broach here, but uh, there are, for the um, sorts of type theories that I uh, study, uh, you can get an induction principle or you, you have an initiality result in one of a number of ways. For example, you could write down your type theory as a generalized algebraic theory and get an initiality result there, or you could write it down as a representable map category and there, you know, uh, there are other things as well. Um, and these frameworks, well, they differ in, you know, how exactly you have to write down the type theory and maybe what type theories exactly they cover. Uh, but more importantly to me, they differ in what induction principle they give you. Uh, and the reason is that they, they differ in uh, what a morphism of, of uh, models of uh, type theory is. So for example, um, if, if you just treat uh, type theory as a very strict kind of algebra, then a morphism has to strictly preserve the context extension. And this is something that is uh, sort of hard to find in nature. Uh, on the other hand, if you use uh, representable map categories or one of a number of other things, you get what's called a, a pseudomorphism of natural models sometimes where uh, the morphism only has to uh, preserve context extension up to isomorphism, which is much easier to find in nature. Uh, now, these proof relevant computability techniques have been uh, um, used a lot uh, in the past few years to uh, prove various uh, um, theorems about uh, dependent type theory, uh, including ones that were previously out of reach, like homotopy canonicity for book hot. And, um, and uh, in the past uh, year or two in particular, uh, I think all of the uh, syntax brain people uh, sort of picked up on um, gluing around the same time, especially following a note by uh, Thierry Cocond on, on the topic showing how to prove normalization. And in fact, so there were, there were three um, papers at the same uh, CS conference in 2019 about uh, gluing for dependent type theory. Now, so how does this work? Well, so uh, this is a diagram down here in the category of models of a type theory. So we have some initial model and we wanna construct a uh, model that consists of computability families. So the, the objects of, uh, of this model are something like um, uh, families or dependent types that are indexed by elements of the, uh, of the contexts. So for example, to prove canonicity, uh, you, you need uh, these sort of induction hypotheses or computability predicates or what have you that are indexed by closed elements of every context. And then uh, you know, upstairs you have uh, for every uh, closed uh, element um, of the context, some type of uh, computability proofs over there. So if we show that, uh, that this uh, G has the structure of a model of uh, type theory, then we get a morphism that sends every context to some computability family. And then we wanna check that um, the, uh, the map that projects out which uh, context this is a computability family for, we need to check that that actually is a, uh, a morphism of models. And the reason is that then uh, by initiality, we have that the composite is the identity um, morphism. And that tells us that uh, that every context is actually sent to a computability family indexed by elements of that same context, not some random other context. So how do we actually use this to prove canonicity? Well, imagine that uh, we have some uh, a closed term of a natural number type, uh, which is a substitution like this, then this gets sent to a commuting square in the computability families. Uh, where on the bottom you have this, uh, the natural number itself. Here you have the family for the closed context, and here you have the family for uh, the uh, natural numbers. And if you look at the morphism up top, this is giving us um, a proof that uh, the natural number we put in is computable, and we just need to arrange that uh, the uh, computability proofs are pairs of a genuine natural number 
and a proof that uh, that that is the numeral that this term is equal to. So that's uh, how you get canonicity out. Um, now here, the proof relevance made the use of raw terms unnecessary as well. Uh, the reason is that the uh, computability proofs can actually consist of a pair of a numeral and some other stuff. So you don't need to use beta reduction to find out what the numeral is. You just project it out of the family. So that's kind of how the proof goes. Uh, it just remains to actually define these, uh, these morphisms uh, in one way or another. Uh, now you could define them uh, by hand. Uh, and the, the problem with that is it's actually relatively clear what the, uh, what the structure for every, uh, for every type former should be. But if you write those all, all out by hand, it's actually very difficult to uh, check that they're all sufficiently natural. I mean, it's kind of clear that they are, but it's, it's really hard to actually check that kind of thing. So in the rest of this talk, I want to uh, uh, just explain how um, my, my work with uh, Sterling and uh, Greitzer shows how to sort of construct these, uh, uh, these morphisms using category theory instead. Uh, so, the uh, computability families model that I uh, was uh, just talking about is actually a sort of comma category. It doesn't really matter what a comma category is, but anyway, the, the point is that um, you can prove canonicity or uh, cubical canonicity or normalization all in uh, very similar uh, kinds of ways, all using some sort of comma category. And uh, there's this idea in, uh, in math called Artin gluing, which is a way of transferring structure from some categories to a comma category. So for example, if you uh, have two Cartesian closed categories and this one has pullbacks and this uh, functor preserves finite products, then uh, the, the pullback over here is also Cartesian closed and this, uh, this uh, map going down preserves the Cartesian closed structure. Similarly, if, if these are both uh, growth and deep topoi and, and uh, the functor is accessible and preserves finite limits, then, then so is this and so on. And this is called a, a gluing functor or something in French I'm not going to pronounce. And we're, okay, we're not the first people to think of using gluing either, right? Um, uh, this idea, the idea that um, computability is related to gluing goes back to the late 70s. Uh, and in fact, even a couple decades ago was used in a normalization proofs uh, for the simply type lambda calculus. And there you get to use the fact that um, that you, the the um, topos you're going into, or that that you're going into something like set that's Cartesian closed. The contexts are Cartesian closed. The functor is nice, so you automatically get Cartesian closed structure on the comma category, which means that you get a model of the simply type lambda calculus. So you're kind of done. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more work to do. In fact, one of the hardest parts is proving or is uh, defining the the normal forms themselves, but but anyway, you, you transfer the structure to the uh, computability families model pretty easily. The problem with dependent type theory is that the category of context of dependent type theory is not nice. Um, you know, you, uh, dependent type theory has a lot of things, uh, but, uh, but not all the way. So you have some pi's and sigmas, but not all of them and, and so forth. So to explain how we get around that problem, uh, let me take a brief detour and uh, mention you know, how models of type theory work. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to just fix a model of some type theory and uh, write C for its category of contexts. Then as we all know, using uh, categories with families or, uh, or uh, natural models or what have you, uh, you can express the fact that, uh, that you have a model of type theory by uh, a bunch of diagrams in uh, pre-sheaves over contexts. So uh, for example, you know that uh, the collection of types and the collection of terms have actions by substitution and, and, and so forth. But you should actually think of um, pre-sheaves on C not just as uh, stuff that has actions by substitution, uh, but also as sort of an enlargement or a, well, I mean, it is a free co-completion of the category of context. It's a nice place where you can talk about things uh, that have an impact on the category of contexts that you couldn't actually formulate right there. So for example, uh, you can uh, say that uh, you have all context extensions by formulating the idea of a context extension 
in the pre-sheaf category and then just saying, oh, by the way, the uh, context extension actually is representable. So what that means is that it's we're, that one is actually small. We're kind of pushing it back down into the category of context itself. Uh, similarly, you can write down uh, what it means to have pi types or sigma types or whatever else um, by drawing some pullback squares in, uh, in the pre-sheaves. And again, because uh, uh, the pre-sheaf topos is uh, growth and decay topos, you get this very uh, rich specification language. You basically get to use type theory to write down what type theory is. And really the goal here is to uh, replace everything with type theory one way or another. Um, so our strategy is to uh, look at um, things that are indexed by uh, pre-sheaves over the context because uh, pre-sheaves on C is a nice category unlike C. So we start with computability families that are indexed by the pre-sheaves here. So we take this pullback on the right and, um, and we get this, uh, uh, this sort of category of like big computability families or computability families that are indexed by more than just contexts. Uh, and we have, uh, and it's, it's uh, very nice, it's a topos. We have this uh, projection uh, vibration down that tells you what uh, every family is indexed by. And then we can pull back again uh, to just look at the subcategory of the computability families that are indexed by contexts only. And this is a very uh, sort of well-behaved thing to do because this is a dense subcategory of, of all of the computability families. Right. Uh, then we, um, now we can do a bunch of type theory. So we, uh, we can find a hoffman streicher universe in the uh, pre-sheaf topos that is uh, big enough to contain the uh, pre-sheaf of types and, uh, and to be closed under you know, all the uh, normal things that we like. And, uh, and we can find a universe of small computability families in G that, uh, that, uh, are, uh, that is indexed by uh, the sort of small or pretty small uh, pre-sheaves over here. Now, because uh, this uh, projection is a vibration, we can uh, take a Cartesian lift here and obtain a computability family that's indexed by uh, all the types. And then by, um, by taking a pullback along uh, the, the upstairs universe, we, we can also get a, a family indexed by all the terms and a projection down here. And then uh, because the uh, upstairs universe is closed under pi types, we, we automatically uh, get sort of pi of, uh, of all of the families upstairs because uh, the universe is closed under pi and it has um, uh, families for the types and terms in it. Uh, the problem that remains is that when you sort of obtain uh, all these structures in an automatic way, you don't actually know that, they, um, that they're indexed by exactly the pi type you want them to be. Uh, they might uh, be indexed by something that's only isomorphic to the pi type that you want. And here we uh, prove a realignment lemma that says uh, you can uh, obtain a new family that's, uh, that lies strictly over type isomorphic to the one it originally uh, lay over uh, and, who's, uh, uh, and it has the same extension as the original family. It has a, uh, isomorphic fibers. Uh, so in uh, my work with uh, Sterling, we show that um, this works for pi sigma and universes. And in our work with uh, Greitzer, we show that you can prove canonicity for a truncated uh, cubicle type theory this way. And this is all very nice because the formerly uh, repetitive parts of the uh, proof now follow from sort of standard results about closure under various connectives. And uh, you got to do a lot of the uh, uh, argument just in the type theory of uh, the topos G. So that's nice. But you still have to spend a bit of uh, time and effort dealing with this uh, gluing vibration, this projection uh, map. And, uh, and checking some things about, uh, about not just G, but also the pre-sheaves on C and, the, and uh, where the gluing vibration takes things. And uh, so I don't really have time to get into it, but uh, there's, uh, I teased in my um, abstract that, there, uh, that um, John Sterling has had some ideas about how to uh, refine this idea as well. So uh, the idea is we want to get rid of the uh, needing to talk about the gluing vibration or the pre-sheaves. And we can do this by recovering 
both the sort of syntax and the semantics within G via an open, well, the, the syntax is a open lex modality and the, the semantics is sort of a closed lex modality, then you can recover all the things that you need to talk about in the pre-sheaves on context, like the pre-sheaves of types, as a modal universe of modal types within uh, the Tobos G itself. And then, in fact, you, the realignment sort of lemma is actually an instance of the sort of strictification lemma in uh, Orton Pitts. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks. And uh, you can, uh, yeah, for more details, you can find these papers I was talking about on my website. Okay, thank you. So we have a lot of time for questions. So I hope I can see if you raise hand, otherwise you can put a comment in the chat or just talk, take the, take the unmute on talk. Uh, maybe I can, I don't know, so no question. So I have a question about the first part. Mm -hmm. um, so this injectivity of pi is indeed, uh, so I, I, I worked at some times on, the, on top of the result of Robin Adams uh, showing the, that untyped conversion can be uh, turned into typed conversion. On the, on the injectivity of pi is a crucial uh, properties uh, in, in this case. And uh, uh, somehow the conclusion was that, uh, so it's not well, uh, it's not done uh, a, a lot like this, but that there is something central, which is, uh, um, how would it, well, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, parallel uh, reduction. The, the kind of reduction you use to prove uh, confluence. So, and, uh, so somehow, so I believe that this should be central in the way we present type theory. So we are a lot, uh, we are a lot uh, in, the, in the continuation of the way it was presented by Martin Lowe uh, with uh, uh, reflexivity, transitivity, symmetry. And, uh, I believe that if we want to emphasize the properties of uh, type theory, we need to be to have presentation which are closer to the technical tools uh, which we use to prove properties of the of the of the theory, and relying on uh, on this uh, typed uh, this parallel conversion, for instance, is one of the of the things we we could do. So it's not. It's not usual to do it, but somehow I believe it's a good, uh, it should be a, a, a good way because it, goes, it gives easily good properties. So I wonder what is your opinion about that? Yeah, um, so I sort of half agree. So I, I think that, uh, that the, the way that we currently present type theories is kind of pessimal in some way. It's the worst of both worlds because as you said, you know, it sort of is, too far from the kind of properties that we actually rely on in the implementation. It's too far from you know the implementation itself, mm -hmm. uh, and right. So, uh, and, but maybe we're we're a little fooled by the fact that we're sort of writing down lambda terms. We think therefore it's you know <laughs> that it has something to do with the implementation, and it kind of doesn't, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely agree uh, in in that regard. But I also feel that. Uh, so maybe we should present type theories in two different ways. One, where we kind of write down a very algorithmic presentation, right? And another one where we, uh, uh, where we just write down a mathematical presentation, kind of like what I was explaining where, you know, you can write down like having pi types as the existence of, of some pullback. And, you know, there, that's, it's just kind of isolating the mathematical content, right? That, that doesn't really have anything to do with like how we spell it or, you know, anything like that. Um, yeah, so I kind of feel that, you know, what we're doing now maybe tricks some people into thinking that we're conscious of implementations when we're writing down the rules of type theory, but I think we're, we're sort of not. And one of the 
uh, one of the aspects of sorcery of type theory is that, you know, the uh, we type theorists are good at kind of eyeballing some presentation and figuring out whether or not it will have, uh, whether or not it will satisfy these uh, crucial properties, right? Um, and, and just to, to answer specifically about uh, the parallel um, reduction, in, again, that, that's something though that uh, comes up if you're sort of using this like beta normalization strategy, right? But if you're, if you're doing something like uh, NBE, you're, you're, uh, you have a completely a deterministic reduction strategy that you're using to implement uh, you know, conversion and, and type checking. Uh, so you know, you, there's no, like there's no question about um, confluence or anything like that, that that would be the reason why you would use um, parallel reduction. But, but yeah, I, I basically agree with you. And I think we should be both uh, more mathematical and more computer yes. scientific, depending yes. on uh, yes. what we're trying to do. Yes. Yeah. So, was there questions? I don't see all participants, so. So I think the best is that you unmute if you have a question. So maybe I can ask another question. Or, sure. uh, in the same vein of the previous question. Uh, indeed, the, in an implementation, we try to be uh, deterministic uh, in uh, type shaking. So in some sense, this means that uh, uh, in an implementation, it's important to uh, that uh, the input terms that you give, that the terms that you give, uh, is exactly the relevant information to to get the full derivation. So that the the derivation itself is just an edge prop, and mm -hmm. that all the information is in the term. And uh, I believe that I I don't know exactly if there are the initiality. Uh, uh, Conjecture is about that, maybe? I don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> right. So it's, uh, but, I think everyone has a different opinion about what exact part of initiality is, hmm? is the problem. Um, because hmm. there's, like I was trying to convey, there, there are a lot of sort of questions that one might ask. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you can, one way to kind of think about normalization, for example, is you, you can think of it as saying that, uh, you know, the, the initial, so I guess the way I'd, I'd like to say it is that uh, the, the initial uh, model is just, I don't know, the, the, the derivations themselves, or it's, it's a type theory itself, uh, and ideally in a way that's kind of uh, independent from the exact way that it's presented, because, you know, maybe I'm writing it down using like pullback. So I do, there isn't even like a notion of exactly what the rules are, exactly what the derivations are. It doesn't really matter at that level. Uh, but then uh, uh, normalization theorem is basically saying that you can present uh, this, that theory using this very rigid, very like set, uh, uh, very, you know, very discrete kind of presentation. So it's, it's, uh, it's checking that that thing is actually another version of the, uh, you know, of the initiality um, or of the, of the initial model, that is. Yeah. So, no, no more question. I mean, uh, no, no one hesitating to ask a question is willing to ask one now. Maybe I can ask a question. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering. So, um, so you, um, so in your first part of your talk, you mentioned that um, well, gluing comes to the rescue. So gluing has applications to normalization. Um, what else did you mention? Well, you mentioned a number of things, and I think in when you went to the second part of the talk, um, you only mentioned you mentioned as an example something like, I think it was normalization to a truncated form of cubicle type theory. 
So is your, are your methods that you present in your second talk also useful for some of these other applications that you mentioned in, your, in the first part? Or have you uh, thought about this? Right, so um, yeah, basically the, um, right, so these, all these sort of uh, properties, the, all the brooms, um, yeah, uh, over here are sort of, um, they either fall into the camp that they're, it's uh, basically a property of a very specific kind of presentation, like admissibility of substitution is really a, like a very technical uh, question about, uh, about a specific way of presenting type theory using raw terms. So it's kind of obviated if you're, if you're looking at the level of like the theory and not some presentation. Subject reduction is a property of, a, of an algorithm, not a property of a theory because it, it's not, it doesn't make any sense to say that uh, two things are equal, but they have different types. Um, and, uh, but then uh, these, these other sorts of properties up here, uh, yeah, these are sort of invariant properties of a theory and, and, um, and as, as I was trying to show, they're, they're sort of at the heart of the correctness of, of the algorithms that we use. And, uh, and those are the things that are all being, uh, uh, that are, can all be proved using, um, using these gluing techniques. And in fact, yeah, versions, of, well, I mean, strong normalization specifically is a, uh, is a statement about uh, beta reduction, but the sort of invariant version of it is just the, the fact that you have a normal forms presentation. And uh, you know, that's something you can establish with gluing. And then injectivity is a corollary, canonicity is a corollary or something else you could prove instead. Okay, so you think, okay, so all the other applications that you mentioned are basically corollaries of strong normalization, is that? Y yeah, is that sort of points? either, yeah, okay. yeah they're, they're either like not an invariant notion um, okay. Or they are, uh, or they're uh, corollaries of a of a normalization theorem, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Clear. Thanks. Was a hesitating question. Or? Otherwise, I can ask one more. I don't know how many times we have. Chris, thank you. Just, just, uh, just uh, a, an informal question. So when you present uh, uh, categories with family in a syntactic way, like uh, Alton Kirsch, Taposi, this kind of, of works, uh, so there, there is a lot of redundancies in, uh, in the derivation. So if you formalize it, you have a term, you are in a meta language like Coq or Agda, and you formalize it, and you see these, these derivation as terms, but these are terms with a lot of redundancies. How do you see raw terms? Do you see raw terms in general as just the minimal of information that you need to reconstruct uh, uh, the expression of a categories with families without the redundancies or do you see it uh, as something different uh, than the derivation itself? So do you see it as just a short form of the, of the derivation containing the minimal of information uh, to reconstruct the whole derivation or do you see it as something different? Yes. Right. Well, I'd say the raw terms still have uh, redundancy because they're not considered up to the judgmental equality, right? So you still have, uh, you know, a bunch of different ways of presenting the same term. I mean, the same, the same like equivalent class of terms. Um, but yeah, and, and uh, usually, you know, you, even in the most manual version of raw terms, you don't mark conversion. I mean, I suppose you could, but you, uh, that's not how we do it. Uh, so, so it kind of doesn't actually correspond to derivations. I feel because it's it's you know, yes, it's it's, it's some of the information, but not other information, and it's not quotiented properly. Uh, yes, but assuming that you have a canonical way to reconstruct a derivation of conversion, then there is on the conversion is decidable. There is enough information to reconstruct uh, one. Non-ambiguously, one derivation. 
Right. Well, except still the the question about like beta, right? Um, and if you think that a, a derivation of uh, of um, you know of uh, uh, the the redex uh, a, a reduced uh, version of some term is different from the derivation of the of the redex. Um, Yeah, so so I, I guess what I'm saying is it's it's sort of uh, a way of hiding some information and not other information, which is fine. But it's uh, yeah, I think it's hard to kind of say that it lines up exactly with something that's okay, uh, okay. that's a very good thing to have here. Okay, right. So I don't think I will ask uh, one more time if there is a question. So I believe we we stop. We make a, a couple of minutes break. Uh, yes, uh, uploading. Sorry, I'm, I, I forgot about uploading. So we can do it twice because I forgot before the. Break. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're doing uh, to give the.